So, there are lots and lots of different species of oil in the world. Um, I was loving looking this up when I was writing this talk. Um, there's about 250 different species of oils in the world, and they're kind of all kind of reasonably similar shapes and sizes, but they come um, kind of in a big range um, of kind of places where they live. You know, a lot of them are boreal, live in like forests and open land, but you get something like borrowing oils and fish oils and things. Um, and there's a few really big species like fish oil and Eurasian eagle, which are huge. And then I discovered the smallest oil in the world is called the elf oil, and it's five to six inches tall. Um, so you need to Google that one. It's the cutest thing ever. Um, so yeah, they're, they're a really amazing bird and come, you know, there's so many of them around the world. But um, we only have three in Ireland. So these are the three species that we have. The barn oil, the long-eared oil, and the short-eared oil. So we're going to launch a really quick poll. Simon, if you don't mind launching that first poll. Um, and it basically just asks if any of you have seen an oil in Northern Ireland. So any of these species. And you can pick multiple answers. So if you've seen a barn oil and a long-eared oil, um, you can pick both. So it's just interesting to see if anyone's seen any of these species. And just in Northern Ireland, it doesn't count if you've seen them anywhere else. So just here. That's good, thank you. Coming in. Interesting. Nearly everyone. Okay, so um so over half of you have never seen any, which is probably the more likely answer than I was thinking. Quite a few of you have actually seen a bar now, which is interesting, 34%. Nearly 20% of you have seen a long-eared oil and only one person has seen a short-eared oil in Northern Ireland, so that's really interesting. Thank you. There we go. So, they're the three species we have, all quite distinctive um, in their own right. Um, interestingly, and they all have very distinctive features, um, the barn oil is probably the most recognisable species, so a lot of people will know what a barn oil looks like. Um, this um, slide is to indicate the difference in the eye colour. I find this really interesting. So if you've never noticed this before, um, barn owls have black eyes, long-eared owls have orange eyes, and short-eared owls have yellow eyes. Now, this is kind of supposed to sig signify and indicate when they hunt. So barn owls, black eyes means they're a bit more nocturnal and they hunt at night. Um, long-eared long that's kind of trying to say they hunt more at dusk and dawn and short-eared owls hunt in the day so they have yellow eyes but actually long-eared owls are quite nocturnal as well but it's just really interesting and that's something um, that is quite significant for all of the owl species across the world and that's a good indication of when they hunt um, so we'll just go back to this one too they, they do look very they're very different when you start looking at it and again barn owls have this very distinctive um shape face here and the um the short eared and long eared are a bit kind of browner in color but we'll go into more of those details so that's the three of them i'll talk about each one a bit more in detail but what do they eat so um they have a very similar diet here in northern ireland so this is a wood mouse on the top to so the wood mice house mice rats and pygmy true so those are the three main prey items. Now, most other places, they eat voles. So voles will make up about 75% of their diet in places like England and Scotland. But because we don't have any native voles here, um, they yeah they, they don't eat them. I mean, we have invasive bank voles down in the Republic of Ireland, so they do feed on those there. Um, but at the minute, these are their main food sources. So small mammals is really what we're looking for. They will occasionally eat other things. They're known to eat the odd bat, frog, small bird, um, but really small mammals is what they kind of are designed to hunt. So lovely pictures. They will swallow food whole. A lovely picture of a long-eared oh, with a big rat on the right there. Um, they'll eat their prey whole. They feed it in smaller bits to their chicks, but basically they will just swallow food like this. They're perfectly designed for hunting. They've got huge big talons. They've got a kind of bigger talon at the front here, which they will basically kind of, when they fly down, they'll kind of like spike it on the back of the head. Um, so the prey gets killed very quickly. 
but they will swallow this and then what happens is they can't digest all of the bones and fur so then they will produce a pellet so pellets are a good indication of if an owl has been around and quite often we see more pellets than the birds themselves this is something for everyone to keep an eye out for owls are not the only species to produce pellets Buzzards, kestrels, and corvids all produce pellets. So I'll quite often get them sent to me and um, from other birds. And ones, you can tell the difference between them. Corvid pellets usually have like greens in them, and buzzards will have more varied um, diet, you know, like kind of items in them. Whereas owl pellets only have fur and bones, that's all that's in them. Um, so yeah, that's really interesting. And you can tell the species, you can tell that what species has left that pellet. So a barn owl pellet is about the size of your thumb. It's kind of, it's quite big. So that's my hand for reference. That's quite a big one. It, was, it had a big rat skull in it. So they will basically regurgitate about two of these pellets every day. So it's quite a common thing. And if you find a nest box full of pellets, you know, they're quite active there. You can also find out how recent that bird's been visiting that site because of how fresh the pellet is. So if the pellet's still damp, um, you know, that's maybe within a week of the bird visiting. So that's really interesting. So yeah, barn owl is about the size of a thumb, really dark, and it's the biggest one of the three. Long-eared owl are much smaller and greyer. Um, and the, ha the habitat you find these in is a bit of an indicator too. Quite often longer dog pellets, you'll find them at the bottom of trees. Barn owl pellets, you find them on fence posts or in the open. And then short eared owl, um, they are more like, kind of the sizes in between. They're almost harder to tell apart, but the habitat will be an indicator because they're an upland species. Um, so yeah, a pe the pellet is a really good way of, of um, identifying um, the, between these three species. So we'll talk a little bit about each one so far now. That's really the one that we work the most on and that we kind of know the most about. Um, but what a beautiful bird they are. One of my favourite species I get to work on or I've ever worked on. Really, they're fabulous. Um, and you can see here they're very, very distinctive. You know, everyone kind of knows what they look like. They're beautiful, very pale, ghostly. As I said, they have this heart-shaped face and that basically helps kind of channel the sound so they can hunt. They are perfectly adapted to hunt in darkness. Um, so the sound kind of channels in and they have one ear higher than the other, which means they can hear direction, basically. Um, so they're just amazingly adapted to, to being a nocturnal hunter. You can see here the difference between a male and a female. It's not always that easy to tell, but the female here is on the left with the buff throat patch. So she's usually darker and buffer in color and the male on the right is much whiter. You can see they're both speckled because they do, they do say they have like a, the female has more of a speckled breast and you can tell there um, the female is more speckled, but the male is still speckled. Um, but yeah, that's one way of telling them apart. And you can actually see there the the female's even darker on the back as well. Um, but apart from that, look very similar. And you wouldn't really know that unless you got a close-up. You're not going to really tell if you're quickly seeing it flying at night. So the all of the lovely folklore, um, Irish folklore about the banshee, you've probably heard of that before. Um, that all comes from the barn owl. So um, the barn owl's name in Irish translates to the graveyard screecher which is fabulous, I think. So these creepy kind of images of a pale woman, not unlike myself, out um, in the wilderness in Ireland. And this screaming came from barn owls because it was a pale figure and they make this really eerie, eerie screech. Um, so you can just imagine that. They can look quite ominous, you know, um, if you're seeing them at night and hearing the, this noise. Um, Sorry, I thought I had the sound, but I've got it later. Um, but yeah, they're also known as the screech owl. They don't do a twit twoo, they do a really blood curdling screech. And a lot of people will say to us, you know, they think they've heard a barn owl. And I will ask what it sounded like. And it, unless it's like really eerie and blood curdling, I'm like, you know, it's, it's not a barn owl. You'll know one if you've heard one, you will. So you think. From those pictures I showed you before, very easy to tell barn owl from long-eared owl, but in fact, 
when they're in flight, it's actually quite difficult to tell them apart. This picture is fantastic. It was taken in Portugal and um, it's actually amazing to see there how um, kind of similar they are. Um, and if you see the paleness underneath, um, I can tell you how easily they can be confused. We got a, get a lot of reports of people thinking that it's a barn owl and it turns out to be a long-eared owl. So it's just something to be aware of. And you can also see in that picture on the right, long-eared owls don't always have these tufts up. Um, so that's quite significant. So if you're if you're driving along and you see this in your headlight, you'll just be like, oh, it was white. Um, and in Ireland, in places like from Ireland and stuff, um, they refer to long-eared owls and barn owls as white owls. So it gets quite confusing, you know. Um, but just be aware that they can be similar. So where do we find barn owls? Um, I suppose where do they hang out? They are traditionally a cavity nester, so they will nest in old trees. They were here long before we invented barns, even though that's you know that's the name we decided to give them, but they were here long before we had barns. So they're a cavity nester, they like holes in trees. Um and we have a lack of mature trees in Ireland, and that's one of our problems. We have a lack of natural nesting places. They then, you know, used to nest in old stone barns and we have a lack of those now too because we've developed these nice new fangled um, barns and sheds and everything. Um, so yeah, they definitely, um, that's one of their issues, a, la a lack of nesting places. But luckily they do use artificial nesting boxes, both indoor and outdoor, um, and they will use these. Basically they just look for that kind of hole and that's the thing we've tried to emulate with these nesting boxes. So they have little owlets. They are just coming back to their breeding sites now. They are monogamous and they are site faithful. So they'll usually stay unless something happens, something disturbs them or one of the pair dies, they will remain together. My barn owls only lived about four or five years old. It's not very old actually. Um, and they usually have one brood a year. They can have two. But usually they'll have their first eggs around April. This varies massively with the weather, but they'll lay eggs over different time periods and so that they have chicks at different ages. And that's basically a strategy to make sure that some of them survive. Um, and sometimes you get ones that are much older than the others. And um, sometimes the bigger ones eat the little ones and also a little bit grim. But um, you can see here on the right that um, these four chicks are actually much different in age. When you look closer, the two in the middle still have the really fluffy down and the two on the outside have more adult feathers. And um, so you can tell that. Um, and this one up the top, they're not actually that pretty when they're when they're like that until they get fluffy. But yeah, they're a bit strange looking like a big bald chicken at the start. Um, but yeah, this um, the weather plays a big impact on them. And we've had, you know, chicks born as late as September and October. Occasionally they can have a second brood, which is great. Um, if the weather's right, but sometimes they can fail, and, but they'll keep trying. Um, and the chicks, if they're born early enough, they are ready to breed by their first year. So the next year they can go on and breed, which, um, which is good. Um, as you can see, the different kind of stages of them. Um, until they get to an adult so they start looking a bit funny but they kind of start looking close to an adult this picture on the left you know that adult's still feeding them but they look very adult like and we've been up to nest sites where um you know they're maybe eight weeks nine weeks old and they they look um very adult like already you know and um, they've got these adult feathers so the um, they'll nest in an area, the female will stay with them mainly, the male will hunt and then they'll both go out hunting um, and it depends on the, if they're in a nest box, sometimes the female, if there's too many chicks in there, she'll go off and leave them, she'll hang out somewhere else, maybe roost in another box um, to get some peace, um, but still come back and feed them for a while. So here are some of the different chicks, let me see if this is going to work. So, there we go. So those are some very noisy barn owl chicks. 
um, that is classed as snoring, is what we call that sound. So that's a noise you hear from a box. It's a very strange sound, um, but that is basically a bunch of barn owl chicks begging for food. So it's a very odd noise. And this kind of what they look like. This was um, a chick from last year at Mount Stewart. Um, these are long-eared owl chicks look totally different and um, you will find them out on trees like this so their behavior is slightly different they'll come out and perch on trees and branches and beg for food at this age where the barn owls would just hang out in the cavity waiting for food to be brought to them and so it's slightly different this sound is very distinctive let me play it and see if anyone recognizes it oh. mm -hmm. Oh, you see the dog go went mad when I was playing this earlier. So that is described as a squeaky gate. So if you can hear that, like a really squeaky gate. So a very different noise. I get a lot of of this sound. This is probably the most common way that people will see or hear long eared owls. You don't see adults that often, they're very elusive. But in the summer, around July time, we get constant videos and sound recordings of this. And um, people will ask, you know, be like, I've heard a barn owl. And they will describe that as a screech. And actually, the screech is a very different sound. And this is more like a squeak. Um, so, yeah, that is um, the long eared owl. The Katie, just, be just before you move on, um, there was a couple yes. of people said that they couldn't hear the, the barn owl. One minute oh. you played it. Do you want to try it again? Just Play it again, yeah. Can you hear that? No. Can you not? Oh my goodness, it's so loud. Could you hear the long ear though? Yeah. Well, oh, that's so weird. I can hear it here. Oh, I don't know. I don't know how. I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's like, that's basically it. <laughs> That's my best impression of, of a barn owl chick. Um, it's basically like a hissy, snorry sound like that, as opposed to that squeak. Sorry, I don't know why that's not working. Um, oh, sorry. And this here is a short-eared owl chick. So they look more similar to a long-eared owl chick, um, but a bit more of a kind of rounded head. And you'll find them, they are ground nesters, so they're more likely to be found in the ground. You probably very rarely will come into contact with a short eared owl chick, but um, yeah, that is what they look like. So a bit about long-eared owls, this photo's fab. They are, um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful birds. So these little tufts are not ears at all. They are called long-eared owls, but um, these are just feathers and they basically can go up and down and they always go up when they're like a bit alert. Um, so they don't always sit up. So here you can see some beautiful pictures of them sitting with their ears up. Uh, well, not their ears, but... Um, and then this picture um, in flight and those little tufts, they're basically feathers, are down. Um, so that's just so you're aware that they don't always have this because people will be like, no, their, their head was very round. Um, so they're quite distinctive. There's a lot, they have a lot more barring on them um, and underneath than um, bar now. So sometimes we have to identify them from um, thermal imaging, which is really hard. And the boat for the most part, you can identify them as long-eared owls from the barring. Um, they're, they're basically more stripy. Um, and I thought this was interesting just to compare long-eared owl and short-eared owl in flight. Um, so they're reasonably similar looking, but again, um, long-eared owls are much more nocturnal and um, short-eared owls are more likely to be flying in the day, also dusk and dawn, but the day. Um, but if you notice, one thing is short-eared owls have much rounder wings, so they have much rounder wing tips. So again, if you if you pick if you get a very bad picture, um, you can it's easier to tell from the outline, and you can also see their tail maybe isn't as long and thin. Um, and short eared owls have this very distinctive what they call panda eyes. So they have like dark the eyes, um, but they have much very big round yellow eyes. Um, so yeah, that's the difference between those two. So this was a little close up. This was unfortunately a dead long eared owl that got reported to us a 
couple of weeks ago. Now, interesting, this was reported as a barnell, and I just wanted to show these photos so you can maybe show why, see why it was reported as a barnell. Somebody, it was on the train tracks um, near Carnley train station, and it was hit it, the poor thing had flown into a fence and broken its neck. But the way it was hanging was the wing was out like that. And so it just looked very pale from going past. You can see how pale that is. And actually the males are much paler than the female. So this was definitely a male. Um, and I just love that picture of the legs. You can see all the little fine feathers. It, just, it looked like fur, doesn't it? Um, and those legs and the big talons. I thought it, it was very sad, but very lovely to see the bird up close. So where do long eared owls hang out? So they are a tree nesting species. So they nest on the top of mainly big tall trees such as conifers um, and native native trees as well. Um, but they like old crow's nests high up. So they have very different nesting behaviour to barn owls. Um, so they'll have a nest like this, very high up. Um, and they would be found in quite a lot of our of our forestry. Um, I'll talk all about the distributions of the three, but um and this basically is, this is so funny one of the things that you can do because people sometimes ask us can you provide a nest box for long eared owls and what pe what you actually do is put up a hanging basket high up in a tree now we don't regularly do this they don't really need it if they're not the same as barn owls they can usually find somewhere to nest they don't really have a lack of nesting places so they'll just go high up in any like old jackdaw nest or something um but yeah, you can put up a hanging basket like that, um, which is great. And they are seen to use them, which is really interesting. Um, so short-eared owls, they are completely different again in their behaviour. And they are a ground nesting upland species. So they do not breed in Ireland. They have very occasionally bred in Ireland, but they are basically a winter visitor. So normally what we get in Ireland are birds from Scotland coming over in the winter. So they nest on the ground like this. So this is maybe you're more likely to see them in the uplands. So we don't get many of them visiting here, but the places that have been seen are the likes of the Glens of Antrim and on the shores of Strangford um, and places like that. So they're an upland species that you maybe go up early in the morning, see them sitting on a fence post or hunting over the heather. And then they nest on the ground like this. I just think it's amazing. It also makes them very vulnerable um, nesting on the ground like that. But, you know, they seem to not do too badly. But obviously, you know, our peatlands and things are very vital habitat for them and our kind of um, heathy areas. Uh, so this is a chick out in the middle of the ground there. So it's not likely you'll have seen a chick here, but... Um, Definitely, you know, there's a chance that you can see an adult, but more than likely in the winter. So I just thought this was so interesting. Um, Short-eared owls are one of these birds that are known to migrate and move like really far. So um, this was a bit of work done by the BTO and this was over two years from 2017 to 2019. And they recorded everywhere this, this one um, short eared owl went and if you follow this it was basically number one shows you it was tagged in Scotland right so it was tagged as a breeding bird in Scotland um, it's even hard to follow and then and then moved a few places in Scotland it went up the very north coast and then it nested in Perthshire um, it then went all the way across the North Sea and it nested in Norway um, it then decided to come all the way back and it hung out in um, Galway for a while, went down to Cork and then decided to go over to Devon, Cambridgeshire, um, England again um, and then it decided to go all the way back to Norway again and unfortunately it perished in a storm. They, they, they checked the date and it died in the sea and they knew there was a big storm so it died. But this just shows you, this is just madness. Um, how far these birds are traveling and short eared owls are, are known to travel quite far. Um, our barn, barn owls and long eared owls don't really seem to do that. We know barn owls have traveled from the top of Northern Ireland to the bottom, but they're way less likely to fly over water. Um, but this is just really interesting. It, it just amazed me and um, see how far this short eared owl traveled. And the fact that it went all the way down to Cork and then, and then to Norway, it's mad, but yeah. So, 
Um, yeah, the next poll I wanted to ask you, if we can launch that one, Simon, is which species do you think is the most common in Ireland as a whole? Simon? <laughs> he disappeared. Oh, there. Thank you. So, yeah, if you could answer that, let me know what species you think. I've kind of given you a couple of clues to that. Um, but yeah, let's see. Okay, that's everyone answered. So, can you share the results? There we go. Um, okay, so 75%, 74% do you think long eared owl? 15% think barnow and 12% think short eared owl. Okay, interesting. Um, so, um, our barn owls are not very common at all. I mean, in Ireland as a whole, um, much more common. Um, than they are in Northern Ireland, but in Northern Ireland we have basically fewer than 30 pairs. That's a figure we work on. We recently did some work with the BTO and they estimated between 20 and 40, but we realistically think there's probably 15 to 20 pairs. That, that, that's the issue. Now, there are hundreds of them down the south and um, west of Ireland. They're doing quite well in Ireland. They've seen an increase, which is really promising. They've seen an increase in England. Um, but ours are, um, yeah, quite vulnerable. And I'll go into the reasons why. Um, our long-eared oils, much more common. So this is 100% our more common species. So well done, whoever got that one right. Um, they are basically everywhere. Now, this map isn't even a good representation of where they are. We think they are far more common than this. They are really under-recorded. So we always ask people, because because we work on barn owls, um, we get a lot of people sending barn owl records to us, but we really want long-eared owl records as well. Because um, I honestly, I think every piece of kind of comfort and woodland you go into, there's a long-eared owl in it. And now I've started kind of looking at them and noticing them. They're everywhere. Um, so it's good to have more records, but they are definitely are a much more common species. We have no idea of numbers, um, but we just know they're much more common. Um, and this is our short-eared owl. So this, these are maps from Birdwatch Ireland, um, by the way. just um, And this is basically, again, not a breeding bird, but a winter visitor. So we would get a handful of records of short-eared owl every year. Um, and normally you can see there um, around Strangford and things that what we do have them up in the Glens of Antrim too. And there was one in Fermanagh two years ago, popped up in the wee island in Loch Garden, which is interesting. The RSPB recorded that. And so they pop up, um, you know, in the uplands. We've seen them in, on bogs in the lowlands too. Um, but yeah, they're one to keep an eye out for as well because they're, they're an amazing bird to see. So we have been working on our Barn Owl Report for 2022 and um, it should be launched ooh, hopefully next week so there'll be a lot more details coming out but um, this is the first time we're showing this map. These are our Barn Owl and Long Eared Owl sightings of last year. So the blue is Barn Owl um, and the brownie colour is Long Eared Owl. So you can see from this that um, a lot of the records we get are in the east of the country. So east of Loch Nair, I would say, is when the majority of barn owls are. Now, this, the long eared owl records are way under recorded because we know they're all over the place. We know they're all over the West. We just don't get that many records of them. People recognise a barn owl far more readily. Um, quite a lot of our barn owl records turn into long eared owl records, and that's what these are because we have a conversation or we get that call and we're like, oh, that's a long eared owl. Um, but that's also great to know. Um, so yeah, I mean, when when we compare the likes of the map of the rainfall and um, arable crops, we can. This makes more sense. So there's way less rainfall in the east than the west of the country. Barn owls don't really like the rain, unfortunately, which could be one of their limiting factors here. Um, they because they're designed perfectly to fly silently and they have these like combs on their feathers and they're they fly perfectly silently they can't really get wet whereas long-eared owls hunt more in the cover and um, they're a bit hardier in the rain basically 
but yeah when you look at the rainfall um it, it makes sense and also a lot of the arable borrow is quite like arable land we don't have a lot in this country but most of it is in the east so that would be one of the reasons why um, we did a bit of work now. We haven't got the 2022 map yet, but this is the 2021 map. And this was all the sightings of barn owls in the whole of Ireland. We collaborated with Birdwatch Ireland. And this is just really interesting to see. You can see all these ones in the northeast and then much bigger spread in the south. Um, now, this could be something to do with invasive bank voles. We're not sure. Um, and it's obviously, you know, the weather um, as well playing a part um, and things like nesting places. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of more old buildings and castles. One of their favourite places to nest in the south are in old castles. We don't seem to have that many of those. So um, there's definitely factors um, in play here, but it's just interesting. You can almost see that big, huge gap and um, in the map there and um, where there's not really many barn owls in the country so that's interesting so why are these birds in trouble so i would say all three species have really declined we don't know um the state of the decline but there's many reasons for it one of the main threats is um agricultural intensification so a change in our farming practices so um for barn owls, this would be um, loss of places to um, nest and also loss of food sources. So the likes of increased pesticide use, you've got less insects and you've got less small mammals, then you've got less um, things for them to feed on. Also, you've got no kind of rough edges, nice hedges for them to hunt over. Um, also, the loss of our woodlands plays a big impact on all of the species um, because that affects in wood mice. Um, but also removes nesting places for um, long-eared owl and then also the destruction of our peatland sites and um, kind of lack of heather and things like that and safe places for short-eared owl to nest so it affects all of them. Um, the weather again um, extreme weather climate change bringing extreme weather is going to have um, a far bigger impact in 2021 we only had two broods of barn owls and that was all because of the weather they all failed in may because it was really wet and they didn't get out to hunt we then had really hot weather and some of our chicks died in the boxes because of that really hot weather and um, so this basically crazy extreme sort of weather all the time is just not helping at all um, and you know it'll impact really windy weather will impact the birds nesting and um, in the woodlands and things like that so yeah um rodenticides so rodenticides have a major impact on a lot of our birds of prey there's lots of studies that show that um there's a rodent level of rodenticide in a lot of birds of prey that get tested when we every, every time we find a dead barn owl, unless it's been obviously hit by a car, it gets sent off for a post-mortem. Um, so if you do find a dead barn owl, please let us know. That's really important information. Um, but we advocate for no rodenticide use. And if you have to use rodenticide, then you need to follow best practice for safe use of rodenticides. Um, and that's something we're hopefully going to talk about a bit more during the year to farmers and landowners and things. Um, road mortality. Um, major roads have a big impact on our birds, now especially barn owls. Barn owls are really, really sensitive to this. We have very few birds and I have already had two dead barn owls on the M1 this year. That's crazy. And that was a breeding male and a breeding female. So that is just major you know um, and there's been lots of research done on this and barn owls seem to be the most vulnerable because they fly low um, and there are measures in place so again one thing that we're hoping to, to talk to people like road service about this year there's all you need is um, a tree line along the road so that the birds are kind of sent up and over um, and do not have these you know we think road, wild road verges are good but really that attracts things in to hunt along them and then they get killed by cars so uh, this is it's definitely a problem um this one signifies predation i don't know if this is gonna play let's see so i don't let me see if this will play oh so this is at our nest site in my chair. 
This is a pine marten. This is not very pleasant. Um, I don't know if it actually shows bringing out the barn owl. Maybe I shouldn't show this, it's not the nicest. But this um, barn owl predated to, or this pine marten predated to barn owl chicks last year. And this was a very new thing for us. And it is great. Pine marten are spreading. Um, we can actually see this as the parent coming in to give off. It knows there's the pine martens in the box and it is coming in to shout at it. Um, now, luckily, you can hear it there giving off. So luckily, um, there was one chick left and the female moved back in the box and protected that. And that was the one you saw the picture of earlier and it fledged and everything, so it was fine. Um, so we have now done some work this winter to pine martin proof. How do you do that? I know. But we've put basically metal around the tree to stop the, the pine martens being able to get up the tree. And um, we're really hoping this works. Who, who knows? But this is a new thing for us. That's something we're trying to tackle because pine martens are another priority species. They were, you know, really at risk of extinction and they've spread. And it's a really good conservation story. But it's just brought this strange conflict. We, we weren't sure it would happen. But, you know, it's something that we're dealing with. Um, so what do we really want to see? What is ideal habitat for barn owls? So obviously we've got your nice peatlands, uplands for our shorter owls, um, woodland and tall trees for and um, edge habitat for long eared owls. But for barn owls, basically we need rough grassland. This is really key. Anywhere that you attract small mammals. So rough grassland, woodland edge. A lot of people think that you need you need woodland for barn owls to nest in, but they only nest on the edge of woodland or an open habitat. And the reason you need woodland is for small is for wood mice and small mammals and in areas where the, the wood the where basically the wood mice will come out of the woodland. Um, so those kind of areas, field margins, pollinator margins, wild bird cover. Arable is great. We don't have a lot of it in this country, but a lot of our birds are actually nesting near arable ground, which, you know, um, is not a coincidence, you know. Um, but things like retaining stubbles in the winter, so mammals have cover, all the things that the um, barn owls do well in. Yeah, so we have been working on the barn owl project for, oh, 12 years, maybe. Um and um it's a great we've done a whole a whole range of things and um, so you can see these uh, this is us doing some ringing so we monitor our nest sites and um, we don't we don't do a lot of this um but ringing is, is a part of it in our monitoring um, and we do surveys every year every july and august we have barn our survey across the country and see one of our volunteers paul there checking the box and um, we provide land management advice this is really important um, for us and we have a load of farmers and landowners get in touch and they're really interested about how to attract barn owls and really this is key. We can put up as many nests and boxes as we want. We're not going to encourage barn owls unless we have um, the right habitat and that, that's just it. You know, it, um, It's as simple as that. So we need enough habitat for them um, to hunt on. So um, we work closely with the likes of RFPB and National Trust, some people um, on this as well, which is really, really good, good partnership work. And, um, and we get out in the ground as much as we can to talk to people and actually walk the farm and talk about what they need. So if we think the land is suitable, then we will put up a box. So we need to do that first bit. Um, now, you can have indoor boxes and outdoor boxes. In Northern Ireland, our birds really like outdoor boxes. This is totally different from England, where they seem to prefer indoor boxes and buildings. Ours like tree boxes, especially in County Down. I'm not sure why. Um, you think with the weather, they'd like to be in a nice little warm hay barn, but they like these tree boxes. Um, and... The design we use is the Barn Owl Trust design. It seems to be the best one. So we have a lot of people make these boxes for us, which is really great. Um, and we usually aim to put up about 20 every winter. So we've just put up our 20th box on Monday. So that's good. And we only put these up kind of until the end of February. Um, and basically before we get into breeding season. And then we leave them alone for the rest of the year. So we also collect um, sightings. So... 
palettes and feathers and um, whitewash and they're all the things to look for. So we tell people to look out for these things. Barn oils are very sensitive. So we say if, we, if there is a barn oil or barn oil lesson, don't go and annoy it. Don't disturb it in any way. But there's plenty of signs to look for. Um, we also are will be launching a new sightings database um, next week, hopefully, which will make it a lot easier to record and that all gets shared with Cedar as well. So, um, And if you do have any sightings, just send them directly to us, to me or to our Barnell email. Um, and yeah, we, we it's really important that any of them um, are vital that, you know, there's so few of them in the country that any sightings important and these help us. Um, to do our conservation work and to understand what areas are most important for barn owls, but it also helps us identify new nest sites. So if we if we keep getting sightings from an area, think, oh, maybe there's a pair of nesting there and we can do a bit more investigation and make sure that nest site is kept safe. So just to finish, um, oh, is this going to work? No, no, sorry. I can't get a sweet video to play. Oh, sorry. You can kind of see it, so it's not playing for some reason. But this is a local barn owl. You don't often see a Northern Irish barn owl, but this was one of our pairs from the Arch Peninsula, and it was doing some lovely yoga stretches. So sorry, but it's a nice image of it in the daylight. I and they use these boxes to come out, and they do their big wing stretches and everything on that. So it's really lovely to see. Um. So thank you. That's us. We have, um, this is our Barnell email, or you can get me or Ross. Uh, we have a Barnell Twitter as well. We'll find out what we're up to on there. Um, and yeah, if anyone um, wants to be involved or anything, please, please get in touch. Um, and there are a few other wonderful talks coming up and there's been some already so if you missed any of them you should be able to get the recordings um, but there's a few more um, and they're all, all really interesting so um, yeah there's another one oh, about Brent Geese next Wednesday which would be good so until the end of March I think it's the last one it's the last of the winter talks okay thank you um let me see if there's any questions. Have you been answering these as we go along? No, I, I haven't. Been. I just wanted to leave them till the end. So, but there's a few there. Um, <laughs> so, first mm -hmm. off, Laura Hopkins um, was just asking about screeching and the scream. Um, mm. so definitely heard this several hours at home. Um, is this something you should report to yourselves? <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. Email that, that Barnell email with your information and um, that would be amazing. Thank you. Um, doo -doo -doo. Um, what are the tough what are the tough score on long ear dial if they're on long ear dials if they're not ears? Um they're like an alarm. They're like in a bit of an alarm. It's like I think to make them like look a bit bigger. You know, like, hey, <laughs> that, that's it. I think I could be totally wrong there. That's what I think they are. Um, I wonder if they have anything to do with, like, you know, if they make them look more interesting to females. I don't think so, but it's just more of an alert thing. Um, yeah, I know they're not ears. They're just funny wee tufts. Um, they make them look very funny. Uh, but yes, um, please, please report any screeching to us. Um, somebody heard long eared all chicks and rattling. That's nice. Um, that's really interesting. Um, if you have a date and time of that, you can send that to me and I'll add it to our sightings. That'd be great. Um, David Saunders was asking there um, if short eared is an upland species, why did it winter at sea level? Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They just have a big, much bigger range in the winter. Um, so they'll move around for food. Uh, that, it's really interesting why they move so far. So like all of the speed, like barn owls and, and, and long-eared owls both have a much bigger range in the winter than they do in the spring and summer. So like barn owls will travel a couple of kilometres only and then maybe five kilometres in the winter. So it's, it's not that far. Um, but for some reason, short it all seem to travel a lot further. I don't know if that's maybe because uplands have fewer small mammals and they need to travel further to hunt. Um, but they'll basically just go where the food is. Um, so yeah, it's harder for them to catch food um, in the winter, which is why they have to go further. 
there's probably a lot of similarities between coastal habitats and and sub upland habitats. They're they're quite heathland like, so they they might be more sort of adapted to, to hunting in those sort of environments because they're quite similar in some respects. They're probably less harsh, right? Than to spend the, up the winter in the uplands. I mean, that's probably quite a harsh thing to do. So they probably just come down for a bit of shelter as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Ruth was asking, what size of territory do uh, a pair need? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I guess you're talking about barnos, yeah. They, so barnos aren't like territorial. They don't set a territory, but they have like a range. So like I was saying, about two kilometres is all they will go during nesting. Um, but it's really interesting... We have so few of them here, but um, one of uh, one of the farms in Strangford has two pairs, so it has two different pairs on the one farm. Now the farm's quite big, um, but that was a bit weird to us, you know. But they they're not territorial at all, and if there's enough food for them, they will easily nest like quite close to each other. Um, yeah, yeah, they're not they're not funny about that, which is interesting. Uh, James just asking there do long ear owls have similar habitat requirements to barn owls yeah I mean they hunt the same thing um, but obviously long ear owls will hunt more in cover so they'll hunt in the woodlands um, and barn owls will hunt on the woodland edge so they both kind of need similar but barn owl like long ear owls rely more in woodlands and barn owls rely more in open habitat but you could get a long ear hunting in the wood and a barn hunting on the edge of that wood, basically. Um, and interestingly, our barn owls are much more nocturnal here in Ireland. Like you see all these lovely videos of them in like England and in Norfolk and things of them flying in the afternoon and hunting in the afternoon. And they don't do that here. And we think that's maybe something to do with the prey that's maybe something to do with the wood mice and things are more nocturnal than voles and that's why their behavior is slightly different um but yeah they hunt similar things but need slightly different habitat requirements basically i think that was a lot of questions does anyone have anything else they want to ask i also great There's so much you could talk about And yeah, it's someone saying they saw a long year down, that's amazing. Um yeah, any Northern Ireland sightings, just send them my way, please. Um it's really good to know. Oh, well yeah, get Googling those barn owl noises and long eared owl noises and hopefully you'll get them now and you'll know what to look out for. Um and definitely have a listen. Go into Woodlands in July and see if you can hear those chicks calling because it's um yeah, it's really lovely. It's amazing. And um we had some nesting really close to our house in a small patch of trees last year. And um, we were just walking and, and we heard them, so that was really nice. So um you'd be surprised at what they nest in. Um, and they're much more common, much easier to see than the barn owl. So yeah. Right, thank you all. So um, if you just fill in the little poll, that'd be great. And um, the talk will be sent to you as well. Uh, oh, someone's asking me something. About, um, uh, best way to differentiate, differentiate tawny and barn owls. So yeah, ta tawnies are very territorial. They're totally different to barn owls. So we don't have tawnies here. Um, but yeah, they, they're more like a woodland species. They'd be similar to long eared owl. But because we don't have tawnies here, long eared owl take, take up that niche. So that's why they're much more common. Um, so tawnies are kind of like brown and do that proper owl noise, like the proper, like a bit more of a twit through, basically. Um, so you can listen out for that in the woodlands. Um, if you want to see a long, if you want to see a long eared owl, where should we go? Any patch of conifers, I, I swear. Go honestly, like any patch of woodland, just give it a go. Um, they are hard to see, but listen for that long eared owl call. call. Um, but obviously, everyone be careful not to disturb owls and anything, and don't be poking around them. But you can go and go and listen to them safely. But that is really the best place to identify them is to just go and listen um, in a woodland in, in the summertime, and hopefully, you'll hear them. Now you'll know. Drive around at night with the windows open, and you will find you'll find a patch of woodland that has long eared owls in them. Honestly, they're great. Um, 
Look, thank you very much. Let you all enjoy your evening and um, hopefully you can get on the summer drama talks. <laughs>